Today was Take Your Child to Work Day, so I'd like to thank my eight-year-old daughter, Caroline, for the transitions in the, in the presentation. Um, we want juniors here, um, and we've invited sophomores here because we figure it's never too early to start. So um, thank you for coming out. Um, we're going to tell you the essentials of what we think you need to know. With this presentation, we found that we cut a lot, and we're getting right to the chase. We're, we're going to highlight what we feel is important. So with that, I'm going to I'm going to turn it over to Jason. Good evening, everyone. Actually, can we get the lights back on in the house? Is that okay? That's better, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now you guys can see each other. No one trips coming in. Um, thank you, Mr. Romal, for having me tonight. Uh, again, I'm Jason Klugman. I actually direct the Princeton University Preparatory Program, which is a college prep initiative that serves low-income, high-achieving high school students in six local high schools, including Lawrence High School, so it's one of our partners, and I'm happy to be here tonight. I'm gonna give you some basic information uh, as we go through. Uh, there are a couple of slides that I'm gonna do, Mr. Mormal is gonna do. If you have questions, please feel free to raise your hand, shout them out, um, make it as interactive as we can. Um, it's not the most exciting uh, information here, and I know there's probably a lot of stress in the room about the process. But getting started, um, there are almost 4,000 different kinds of colleges and universities across the United States, starting from our, our community colleges. Uh, here in New Jersey, we have really outstanding county colleges. So for, for us here in Mercer County, Mercer County Community College has their big West Windsor cam campus as well as a, a downtown campus in Trenton. Any uh, trade or professional interest that you have, you can start that career at Mercer County. So um, we always think about a backup plan. Um, it's always good to have plan A, plan B, plan C, and maybe even plan D. Mercer County is always a great place to think about starting. It also has a great opportunity to transfer. Um, they have partnerships with four of our um, state institutions, um, two of our public institutions, and two of our private institutions offer a four-year bachelor's degree. Once you complete your studies toward your associate at Mercer, you can continue to attend classes at Mercer if you're living at home to save money, and you can gain a degree from Rutgers, from William Patterson, from Felician, or from Fairleigh Dickinson in different programs. So let's, we'll just start with there with thinking about community colleges. Um, there are two-year private colleges that, that offer associate's degrees. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about them because, quite frankly, um, value for dollar, they're not worth it. Um, <laughs> we go to, uh, and, and that's one thing that I'll, I'll, I'll absolutely share those kinds of opinions. And if you want to challenge me, raise your hand. And Mr. Mormile, if you have a, a, a second opinion, um, value is really important. College is very expensive. We want to be as strategic and as thoughtful about the process as we can be. So the next thing to look at is our New Jersey State institutions. Um, can we, so our big flagship university is what? Rutgers, and Rutgers has three campuses. The big New Brunswick flagship campus um, that has, um, I don't even know the student body, it's huge. It's 35,000 undergraduates on four, separate, four or five separate campuses all in the New Brunswick area. Um, offers just about every major you can um, think of. There are some older parts of the campus that aren't really that attractive and there's some really wonderful um, new parts of the campus, particularly the School of Business, which is really a, a beautiful space. Um, from there, in our own backyard, uh, in the area is the College of New Jersey. Um, a lot of people know the College of New Jersey as, Tr as Trenton State. The College of New Jersey actually is the second most selective college in the state behind Princeton. Um, so a lot of people kind of think, oh, TCNJ, not that good of a school. It's actually the best public institution in the state. Um, it's the hardest one to get into. Um, it's actually harder to get into TCNJ than it is to get to Rutgers. Um, and they offer phenomenal undergraduate experience, sort of a small liberal arts college. The problem is, it's just down the road. Um, and for some folks that want to get away, that might not be the best thing. Then we go through the rest of the state colleges. Can we, can we get some, some interactive? Who, who, what else do we know for state colleges and universities? Rowan. Rowan University, which is the old Glassboro State. Kane University. Ryder? Ryder is actually private. So Ryder is a private college. We'll get to private in a second. Right now, I just want to think about the public institutions. We'll talk about the difference as well. 
Uh, we said Rutgers. Did someone say Monmouth? So Monmouth is private as well, like Ryder. Monmouth is private. Uh, Richard Stockton, which is down in uh, South Jersey near the shore, is another Stockton College. So there's another college. Um, it's the farthest north. It's Ramapo. Um, Ramapo is actually another one that's pretty difficult to get into. Um, there's also New Jersey Institute of Technology. For those of you interested in engineering and science, it's actually a really fine, fine institution. Um, there's also William Patterson in Jersey City, which are two schools which um, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about. Particularly, Jersey, we're not going to talk about Jersey City. Uh, William Patterson has some great programs um, that you could consider. So there are the state publics. The, of course, the benefit to going in-state in New Jersey uh, is it's just a lower cost all around. Tuition, uh, tuition fees total per year in a state college in New Jersey is about twenty-five dollars to $30,000 per year. Um, then we start looking at the private institutions, which are going to cost fifty dollars to $60,000 per year. And we started, we have Ryder, we have Monmouth, of course we have Princeton. What else? Drew? Seton Hall. Seton Hall. Monmouth. Stevens Institute of Technology, which is next to Princeton and TCNJ, the third hardest school in the state of New Jersey to get into. So it's a, another phenomenal school. Um, Monmouth, we didn't say Montclair State, but we're talking about state schools. Montclair State's another, uh, it's the second largest of the public schools in New Jersey. Um, there's also Fairleigh Dickinson, and then there are a bunch of sort of non-selective schools within the state. So Felician, St. Peter's, Centenary, uh, St. Elizabeth, uh, and they all offer different kinds of programs. So just things to think about in New Jersey. The big benefit for those of you that are thinking about financial aid and the cost of college uh, if you are eligible for a tuition assistance grant in the state of New Jersey, so typically if you're eligible for free or reduced lunch, or you're a moderate to low income uh, family, there's a tuition assistance grant. And the thing to remember is that that grant in the state of New Jersey only, uh, is only available to you if you go to school in New Jersey. So it doesn't travel out to Penn State or UConn or Notre Dame or USC. It only stays in New Jersey. Uh, so, those, so that kind of gets me to the other state colleges and universities. So the big flagship universities across the country, uh, University of Connecticut, University of, uh, so we've got Penn State and all the different Pennsylvania state universities. Uh, updating my comment about financial aid, if you're not going to be eligible for state aid in New Jersey, you might actually look at a, a public institution out of state, somewhere like the University of Georgia, the University of Virginia, um, the University of Michigan, their out-of-state tuition and fees are just about the same as going to school in the state of New Jersey. Is that about right? Um, no, they're, they're actually, they're, there's a, if you're going as a New Jersey resident to uh, Penn State, it, it's, it's fairly expensive. It's not as expensive as going to a private, but it's still more expensive than going in state. It is more expensive, okay. Yeah. All right, so some, those are also to consider, things to consider. But, but, what I, but what I would say, I think I know what you're yeah. alluding to. Um, the New Jersey State Colleges um, are uh, fairly difficult to get into. The College of New Jersey, there aren't that many speed, uh, seats for all the kids that are applying. So what we found is the state colleges and universities in Pennsylvania and in New York, for New Jersey residents to apply to those and to attend those, the cost is very comparable between going to an in-state New Jersey college as a New Jersey resident, then going to Pennsylvania or New York as a New Jersey resident out of state. They're very comparable. I suggest that if you're looking for uh, alter uh, alternate schools, that, that you start looking there, alternate state schools. Yes. What are some of the New York state schools? Good question. State University of New York, SUNY. Uh, SUNY Binghamton is a good one. SUNY Stony Brook is at Long Island. Who wants to drive to Long Island? You have to go through uh, New York City. But uh, SUNY Stony Brook is in the same consortium as Rutgers. It's a big university like Rutgers. It's a division one institution. Um, it's hard to get to. Um, 
but it, and it's, it's a comparable price to Rutgers. Um, there's a ton of SUNY schools. SUNY Potsdam is seven hours away. It's up by St. Lawrence, but it's similar to TCNJ. So if someone doesn't like TCNJ because it's too close, you have an option for them. Also in New York City, there are the, the City University of New York, which are public institutions, Brooklyn College, Lehman College, and Hunter College, and the City University of New York, right, CCM1, yeah. City College. Um, we have up there uh, a couple of other notations for kinds of schools. So one thing you might hear about is an HBCU, um, which is a historically black college or university. Those schools like Howard and Spelman and Hampton uh, that are traditionally, that traditionally serve an African American population. Those schools, uh, those three are actually quite fine schools um, and all three are private, uh, but Howard, because it's in Washington DC, it's considered a public school for everyone nationwide and the tuition is actually much lower than, it's actually lower than Rutgers. Uh, so um, the next uh, demarcation is a liberal arts college and, and just for a quick comparison, if you think about Rutgers with 35,000 students, that's a large university. Uh, uh, typical at a large university are large lecture hall classes, particularly for your first two years. So you'd be in an auditorium like this for your introductory political science course or world history course. You might have um, meetings with graduate students and not your professor to, to review the material in a large institution. At a liberal arts college, a place like the College of New Jersey or um, right across the river uh, in Pennsylvania, we've got Swarthmore College and Haverford College. Um, up in the Allentown area, Muhlenberg College. Um, those schools are gonna have much smaller classes. Uh, maybe the largest class will be about 40 students at a place like Swarthmore, maybe only 20 students in an introductory biology class. So those are, those are some things that you would see at a liberal arts college. A liberal arts college is also not gonna have a, a major like a business major, uh, much more of the traditional subjects that you think about uh, philosophy, anthropology, political science, psychology, maybe neuroscience at some of these places, physics, chemistry, things like that, but they're not gonna have business or entrepreneurship um, or uh, things that you might see at a, at a larger university. They may not have engineering programs either. Um, the major prestige colleges that we can name, we can go through the Ivy Leagues real quick. I'll give you Princeton. What are the rest? We've got seven more. Yale, Harvard. Brown, Columbia, Columbia. Penn. Penn, Dartmouth, Cornell. and Cornell, and Cornell. All right, those are the eight. And if we, if we expand this, let's think about the next eight of the top universities. What do you guys think? Washington University in St. Louis, top 20, absolutely. Stanford and MIT round out the top 10 usually. There's actually usually one more that's in the top 10. Uh, Berkeley's? Top 20, but there's usually, it's, uh, you think Berkeley's top? I'm trying to give a, a clue. Duke. Duke. Duke, we have Duke, yeah. Caltech. Uh, Caltech. Caltech, actually, Caltech's top five, absolutely. Northwestern. Northwestern in Chicago, absolutely. There are places like Rice in, uh, in Houston, um, USC, University of Southern California is, is raising its game. Uh, my alma mater is Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, one of the top, top 20, um, all, all great schools. Um, so some of the major, major schools that we can think about for prestige, Notre Dame is in there. Um, anything else, anyone else? Carnegie Mellon. Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh, absolutely. <laughs> That's okay. That's all right. That's all right. Okay. So we'll, uh, the other, the other note here is a progressive college. So there are some, particularly some of the small liberal arts colleges that are kind of known for being um, quite liberal and quite progressive. Um, I can name a few of them. Hampshire College um, up north, one of the small liberal arts colleges. Um, Berea College, where it's actually tuition free at Berea College. It's one of the top small liberal arts colleges in the country. And everyone who is there is um, on, um, works. So you work and your work pays your tuition. Um, so it's a really interesting and innovative space. There's a place uh, out in Colorado, Colorado College, um, and they're known for having three-week semesters, and you take one class at a time. 
So there's all sorts of different things. The other thing that we can think about, back to small liberal arts colleges, uh, if we think of the top ones of those, I've named a few already, Swarthmore and Haverford. Um, there's uh, Davidson College. Out west, there are um, the Claremont Colleges, so Claremont McKenna, Pomona, Pitzer. Uh, we also have women's colleges that you might consider that are really phenomenal institutions. Places like Mount Holyoke, Smith College, Bryn Mawr College, or Scripps College out in California, also things to think about. Just naming them off to get started. Um, and then there are specialized institutions, and these are places um, typically that will ask you to uh, submit a portfolio as part of your entrance, um, particularly if you want to do an art um, degree. Um, I personally cannot recommend an art institute, uh, like Art Institute of Philadelphia or Art Institute of Chicago. The Art Institutes of America are for-profit institutions, um, and I, I would say they don't really have the best interests of students in mind. There are lots of great opportunities to study music and art um, outside of that kind of a specialized place. But if you're interested in culinary studies, um, a place like Johnson & Wales, um, if you've got the money, there's a, there's a great education. So something, some of those things to consider. If we switch to the next slide. The fit. So we talked about there's you know, almost 4,000 kinds of colleges. And what you're, starting to, what you're gonna have to start thinking about is what is gonna be right for you as a student. And I see a lot of parents in the audience, so you'll share this information with your students. But it's really the student who has to think about these kinds of things. So when we talk about fit, we talk about a number of different factors. We can think about location. Are you going to be a commuter student? Are you going to live an hour away? Um, I went 3,000 miles away to college. Um, and that was awesome. It was great to just get away. Um, grew up in California, went to school in Baltimore, um, went home twice a year. And, and I was okay with that. Um, made it work. It's a great, great learning experience. But some folks aren't ready to do that. So maybe going two hours away or going four hours away, a train, a train ride away is good. Um, you want to think about uh, if aid is important, remember that that tuition assistance grant only stays in New Jersey. What academics are available? Does the school have your major? Yes, the question. It's actually good at all schools in New Jersey. So your, your, your tuition assistance grant will go with you to Seton Hall or Fairleigh Dickinson, um, even to Princeton. And we'll talk more about financial aid toward the end, and I think there'll be a second session uh, for you next year as you're thinking more about financial aid and thinking about financial aid. But FIT, um, we're thinking about academics and majors and programs. Um, what kinds of things that you're looking for. For the students in the room, anyone have an idea about what they're thinking about doing, studying? Yeah, go ahead, yeah. Engineering. engineering. So you wouldn't want to go to a school that doesn't offer engineering, no. right? So you want to make sure that you're thinking about a school that has engineering. What else? Chemistry. chemistry. So chemistry, you're lucky, because most schools are going to have a chemistry department. But what we're, you're going to want to do is figure out, are, is it a big school, so all your chemistry classes are going to be in large lecture halls, or is it a smaller school that maybe will give you more opportunity to work with faculty? Uh, a smaller liberal arts college will give undergraduate students the opportunity to do research in the chemistry lab. A big university like Rutgers, you're not going to get that chance, because they have graduate students doing that work. So that's something for fit that you're going to want to think about. Anyone else, another major area in the back there? Veterinary. So you wouldn't go to, there are actually, it says two ways. Most schools for veterinary science is going to be a, your graduate degree. So your undergraduate degree might be in something related, so a biology, something in the, uh, something in the um, natural sciences. But for veterinary school, you're going to do that beyond. Um, so you might want to go to a, a school like the University of Kentucky that has a great veterinary science program and can get you started as an undergraduate in doing all sorts of work in some of the facilities that they have, but you're really gonna look toward what you're gonna do for graduate school for veterinary science, okay? All right. Yes? Are there some schools like uh, for a major like engineering you get into a separate college of engineering and you can get like a... Absolutely, so there are a lot of colleges that, um, so some schools like Stevens Institute of Technology you would apply to Stevens and you would apply to the engineering program. Some schools like Princeton have a school of engineering and you would declare that major right away. 
Um, some schools, some of the small abroad schools that don't have engineering programs might partner with another school so that you would do three years at Swarthmore and two years at the University of Pennsylvania and you end up with two degrees. So each school is going to be a little bit different. Um, and each school will ask you at, through the application process to either um, apply to a particular school or apply holistically to the university. Each university is a little bit different. All right. Um, Again, thinking about size, that big thing, that big class like Rutgers or something small like TCNJ, um, how, what, what kind of faculty interaction? Um, are your courses taught by faculty members? Are they taught by graduate students? Um, at Johns Hopkins, my writing courses were taught by graduate students my first year. They were fine. Uh, at Princeton, they hire a faculty, um, a non-tenured faculty to teach the introductory writing courses. So each school is gonna do that a little bit differently. So you might want to consider what kind of academic experience that you want um, and how that's going to impact your learning. Um, campus setting is something that we think about. Do you want to be in a big city, a place like Boston University or George Washington University in DC? Or do you want to be out uh, in a rural setting, something like Bucknell or, uh, or Amherst? Um, you know, what's going to be more engaging for you? Or maybe something suburban like Ryder, which is right here in the suburbs. Um, and then what kind of student activities are available? Um, you guys are going to college in a great time. Um, if we don't think about cost, um, if you think about opportunities at schools, there's been kind of an arms race in the last 10 years, kind of driving up costs in terms of what the dorms look like and what the facilities look like. Ithaca College has this ridiculous recreation center um, with a beautiful Olympic-sized pool. Um, Ohio State, th th it's amazing. Uh, Think of the nicest fitness club you've been to and then quadruple the size and add an Olympic-sized pool, and that's what you know, Ohio State has. Kenyon College, tiny little Kenyon College in Ohio, has, it looks like an airport hangar with a full Olympic-sized pool at one end and a full indoor track at the other end and their basketball stadium in the middle. It's ridiculous. So you want to be thinking about what kinds of activities, what kinds of uh, facilities are available, and how that's going to interact in your collegiate career. Um, and then again, of course, um, and this could be your first consideration, cost and aid. You know, what, you, what you've saved and what might be available for you to spend and to earn. Let's see if there's one more for me here. So as you begin your college search, as you're thinking about things like fit, um, just some quick notes. Um, uh, first of all, you're going to meet with your college counselor here, your, your guidance counselor here, and we're, we're going to talk more about using the tools that you have available to you. But you really want to know why you want to go to college, right? You want to have a reason. So those of you students in the room, raise your hand, the students. All right, so why are you going to college? Gain new experiences. Why are you going to college? To enjoy college life, to, to the experiences. Why else? Go ahead. And the only way to be an engineer is to get a, college degree. get a college degree. All right. So for your future career. So there are all sorts of considerations. You know, there's some stuff that's up there. Um, you want to go to veterinary school? You can't just go to veterinary school. You have to go get an undergraduate degree first, right? You can't, um, can't be a lawyer until you get your undergraduate degree in something else and then go to law school. Um, you can actually be an engineer with just a bachelor's degree, which is, which is great. Um, of course, you want to increase your earning potential. You might want to experience the activities that are there. You might want to do study abroad and see the world. And doing that as a college student is a great way, um, great way to see the world, great opportunities. Um, you might want to try to be in an improv troupe. You might want to do different kinds of community service. You might want to learn about, um, about Shakespeare while you're learning to be an engineer. And college gives you all of those opportunities. But knowing why you want to go is really going to help you start the process. And it's great to be here tonight because you're getting started um, and you're going to start researching your options and we're going to show you some websites that you can use to research your options and really take advantage of what's available to you. There are also um, some local college fairs so you can start meeting with college representatives and um, we'll talk a little bit more about college visits as well. Any questions on this, on this slide? It's a pretty easy one. Okay, so who, who reads the Weekend New York Times? Okay, 
Uh, everyone's heard of Google. Uh, the New York Times, they're running a series, uh, How to Get a Job at Google. So this past weekend, they had part two, How to Get a Job at Google. So if you Google that, How to Get a Job at Google, I'm sure you'll come up to the article, but there's the link up there. Um, guy named Laszlo Bach is the, it run, does all the hiring, 100 hires a week at Google. Um, and he said pretty much what Jason just said. Um, we really need to work with our kids as to why they want to go to school. Why is it that, that they want to go to college? He argues that too many people, too many kids, just throw, go through college because that's what they're supposed to do, because that's the next step after high school. He encourages more in-depth thinking, more conversation between parent and child over this subject. We're going to give you some tools that could uh, get the conversation going with, with your children. Um, he also feels that in college, um, so you want to be an engineer, you're going to learn how to be an engineer, but you're also going to learn job trends. You're also going to learn, okay, so if I go in this direction, that's going to help me in this now, but maybe in 10 years, if I learn, some, if I learn this other thing, I'm going to be more marketable a little bit down the line. So he's also, he encourages kids to think the way adults think after we've been in the, in the workplace for 10 or 15 years. It's a challenge, I know, but um, that's what I'm pushing you guys to do. So a wonderful tool. Uh, all the students in here um, know about this option, know about this tool called uh, Naviance. Okay? Um, the juniors, if you haven't already, you're going to be working with your counselor on your college search with, uh, with Naviance. It does so much for you. Um, gives you detailed info on colleges. It allows you to do a college search. So what a college search is, is um, the, the considerations that Jason talked about, size, cost, location, major. You put in all your preferences in those areas, and it comes up with a list of colleges. And with that, it talks about deadlines, and um, it allows you to track deadlines, and it, it does, it tells you the selectivity, how, how tough it is to get in. Um, it tells you rankings. Uh, it tells you everything that you need to know. Now, the fourth bullet, uh, I'm sorry, the third bullet, uh, career interest surveys. So we work with our sophomores. Actually, we work with our eighth graders and our sophomores on starting to learn what careers are out there, and what careers might be right for individual students. We do, we do both through Naviance. There's also a wonderful tool called personality, the personality assessment. Um, do what you are. Any of the students do the personality assessment? It's called do what you are. It's on, you don't need your counselor uh, to help you with this, you'll go right on. I was able to figure it out myself, uh, and, and uh, that's saying a lot. So you can just go right on, and it takes your personality, your opinion about your opinions about your personality, and it tells you about yourself. But then it also transitions to information on careers. It's a, it's a wonderful tool. The fourth bullet, brag sheets and resumes. Your brag sheet, uh, a junior, uh, the summer before your senior year, you're gonna do a brag sheet, and, that, and the parent's gonna do a brag sheet as well. That's where you're not modest, and you talk about how great your child is and all the different things your child has been doing. Your counselor, who knows your child very well, but not well enough to write a great recommendation, takes that brag sheet and writes a letter of recommendation. 
which um, I believe we're, that's, on a, that's on a slide later. We're going to tell you what colleges look, look for. That's one of the things that colleges look for is what uh, the recommendations from the counselor and the teacher say about your child. Okay, we're going to show you scattergrams in a little bit. They're wonderful. And so I'm sorry to pick on you, our engineer. Um, but so you put, so you do a college search and you get a list of colleges on Naviance. So you have seven schools that you've identified as schools that you're interested in. You have them on your list in Naviance. With that list, Naviance sends you emails when those colleges send their college reps here in the fall to meet with Lawrence High School students. It's, it's an automatic. So you get invited down to come and to hear firsthand from the college uh, rep at the school. So parents, your student, your, ch your child knows Naviance, but if you want to know more about it, ask your child. If that doesn't get you too far, uh, please call, one, please call our, uh, your child's counselor and they'll be happy to walk you through and give you the information that you need to get started. So there's the list I was talking about. Larry Lawrence is graduating from Lawrence this year. So he put his list together. So if you look down a little bit, where Albright sits to the left, that first column is, is a deadline. This, this slide's a little bit old. And then it tells who added the college. Um, that's important because a lot of, t it's important for a parent because a lot of times your child added the college, but then I remember working as a counselor where I added a lot of the colleges. So you get to know who suggested the college and it may mean a, a little different, uh, have a different meaning if the counselor added that college. Um, delivery type, that's application. CA means um, common application, which we talk more about during the uh, senior year boot camp in August. And then senior year, we'll talk about um, the application process itself. And then interest and expectation, those are um, tools for your child to put in what the interest is and what the expectation is. Then you see the quick links on the left. That's everything that Naviance has to offer, everything across the top. Um, okay, moving on. There really is so much information on Naviance. It can be overwhelming, but the more you do it, um, the more familiar you get. So one of the great tools with Naviance is the scattergram. Students, have you seen any scattergrams yet for your colleges? Okay. Um, students like this because it gives a visual. So if you look at that red circle for Larry Lawrence, it's right smack in the middle of the page. I wish it would uh, jump out a little more for you. So that's where, that's where Larry Lawrence's GPA and SAT are plotted for the College of New Jersey based on all the applicants from this high school over the last three, four years that have applied to TCNJ. Naviance does this for all the schools in that list in the previous slide. So he's right there, that red circle. Could everyone see that red circle right in the center? And you see he's surrounded by red X's. That's not a very good sign. We should, probably should have picked a more positive slide for, for Larry. So he's right around the red X's. That means it's not likely that he's going to get into the College of New Jersey. Where does he need to be? He needs to be around the green. So it looks like for the College of New Jersey that any 
Lawrence student will need approximately a 1,200 or better on the SAT with a 3.5 GPA or better to get into the College of New Jersey. Selectivity varies. Um, Larry might be okay at Ryder, for instance. I'm guessing he, he would be with his 3.23 and his 1020 SAT. That'd be good enough for Ryder. For Lawrence, I'm sorry, for Monmouth, which is similar to Ryder. Any questions on the scattergram? Okay, so we want you to go on to Naviance. We want you to do all this research. By the end of the junior year, we want for you guys to put together a list of 10 colleges that you may be interested in, that you are interested in, that you may apply to. Now, we ask that you guys tier your schools. You tier those 10 or so colleges. We want you guys to go for it. Your children have dream schools that they want to go to. Um, give it a shot. The scattergram may not uh, be, be too enticing for that school the way it was for Larry and TCNJ, but uh, give it a try because you never know what happens. So we, uh, we advise a couple of long shots, a couple of reach schools, a couple of match schools, match school, so Larry, I believe he was 3.2, and a 1020 SAT out of 1600. So the green would be right around that area. And just below it would be the red, the red X's. That would be an example of a match school. There's no guarantees, but you're likely, if you apply to 10 match schools, you'll get into roughly 50% of them at least. And then probable likely schools. Okay, so for a student who um, is going to get into TCNJ, or TCNJ is a match school, but it's not a guarantee, then uh, a school like Monmouth or Ryder would be a safety school for that student. And we ask that the students, of course, have a few safety schools because there are no guarantees and the more research you do, I've had students be very happy at safety schools. Conversely, I've had students that have been unhappy at their REACH schools. They love the name, the prestige of the REACH school, but once they got there and they found out what the school was really like and how it wasn't good for them, they, they um, found that they didn't make the best choice. Okay, so that's to do over the summer, I'm sorry, before the summer, and then over the summer for you seniors to be, last August we had 75 seniors at our boot camp. Students in the room, are you familiar with the boot camp? You've heard of it? Okay, so we have a, an application boot camp in August. Um, I think it's the last week of August. I think it's August 25th is the Monday that week. It's a four-day boot camp where we go over the Rutgers application. We go over the application process. We go over paring down these 10 schools to a workable list that we're gonna have you guys apply to. We go over the common application. We go over the essay. And we have our good friends from Ryder come over and help with some of the specifics. So you'll, you'll, you'll see that coming up. We've set a date, but we haven't advertised it yet. If you ask your senior friends, they'll tell you about it. Any questions? Jason. Just a, a quick note, on the Naviance family connection, um, the scattergram and the list that you saw is actually what we see on the counselor side. Um, the family connection looks a little bit different, um, but it has, uh, and I only, I went to the training on Naviance today, 
um, but it has a, a tremendous amount of tools that you should be um, really taking advantage of. Doing the surveys, um, engaging with the scattergrams, uh, that kind of data is, is really, really interesting and is really helpful for you to start thinking about that list of schools. One of the things that we do with PUP is that we require all of our scholars um, apply to at least three public in-state schools and everybody applies to Rutgers. Um, Rutgers is a top 100 state flagship institution. Um, between Newark, New Brunswick, and Camden, we're likely to get an acceptance, and it's good to have that in your back pocket. Um, each campus offers some different things, some different opportunities. Camden is the smallest of the three, um, so smaller classes, a little bit more um, intimate setting, but it's Camden, so you have to you know, pay attention to that. Um, but we also say, you know, the College of New Jersey, Stockton, Rowan, um, NJIT is option. So thinking about, you know, in your list of 10, having maybe two or three public in-state schools um, as options. The other, um, uh, the rest of it as you go through, you're going to, you know, be doing some searching and figure out how far you want to go away, the size, the majors, the aid, all of those things. Um, one of the things that as you're starting to look at this, um, you might want to think about how you measure up, not just on your SAT scores and your grades. Um, and the SAT that, the, that Naviance uses for the scattergram is just your verbal section, sorry, your critical reading section and your math section. Those are the two sections that are used in that scattergram. The writing section, which, brought your, which will bring your score up to a 2400 maximum, um, isn't part of that scattergram. And uh, most, all of you are still gonna be taking the three section SAT. So just be aware of that. I'll talk a little bit more about the SAT versus the ACT a few slides from now. But if you wanna think about what colleges are considering, the very first thing that a college looks at after they read your name and your school is your high school transcript. And the last year that they have full information about you is your junior year. So if you are a junior, you have about eight weeks to make sure that your junior year grades are as outstanding as they can be, right? You don't have any time left. You have eight weeks. As astounding as they can be. They also are gonna look at your senior schedule and they're gonna to wanna to know that you're still taking um, a rigorous schedule. You know, that you're still, if you're in honors, if you were in honors, that you're still in honors classes. Maybe you were in college prep and you're gonna reach for an honors class. Maybe you were in honors class and now you're gonna add an AP. Maybe you took three AP classes as a junior and you're gonna take three more as a senior. You're gonna keep that level of rigor up. Um, the last thing the college wants to see is that you did all this hard work your junior year and then your senior year you decided to take culinary, wood shop, gym, uh, history through film, and, um, and a college prep English class. That's not gonna, that's not gonna show um, an, a real intent to learn. So thinking about your senior year and your senior year grades are gonna be important. Um, the last set of grades they'll get from you uh, when you apply are your first quarter grades, and then they're gonna ask for a mid-year report. So all of those grades are important. Um, and I'll just say this as well, you have to finish strong your senior year because if you completely bomb out after you've been admitted, it is absolutely within a college's um, right and it's in, within the realm of possibility that they will rescind your admission. So if you decide you get senioritis in April and by June all your A's and B's are D's and F's, you might lose that spot in your dream school. Um, so transcript is the first thing. The next thing they do is they start looking at test scores and we'll talk a little bit more about the SAT and the ACT. And in your research you want to make sure that you're aware what does the college ask for. Do they just want an SAT? Do they want the ACT with writing? Do they want subject tests? Or are they test optional? There are a lot of really good schools, um, Bates College, Wake Forest University, Dickinson College, that are going test optional. So if you're not a good test taker, your SAT scores aren't getting you above the median, which would be a 500 in each section. If, you, if you're not cracking that, but you're getting straight A's, you can go test optional. And for Dickinson College, what they'll do is they'll ask you to submit a graded paper. So you took APO's history, you've got a couple papers that you wrote, you wanna find your best paper that's got some teacher remarks on it that you earned an A on, and you would submit that with your application. So the test scores, for most schools, they still are asking for tests. 
Um, but there are a lot of schools that are going test optional, so you want to think of those options as well. Um, clearly, your grades on your, on your transcript, we talked about levels of courses, making sure that you're progressively getting stronger or at least staying where you're at. So if you're in honors, you're staying at the honors level, maybe reaching for an AP. If you're at college prep, maybe reaching for an honors if you can do it. Um, most colleges are going to ask for an essay. Uh, there are about 500 colleges that use the common application, and there are five essay prompts that you can choose from, and you can just do the same essay for each of those colleges that you apply to. Rutgers has its own essay, and they actually have a fill-in transcript. You self-report your transcript in the Rutgers essay. So that boot camp is a great, great opportunity. I hope that you're involved in extracurricular activities and community service, not just for the fact that it's a part of the college process, but because you believe in giving back to your community, that you have some um, advantages that you've gained and you want to give something back. That's why we do service, not necessarily just to get into college. Um, but that's important. Leadership roles are important within various organizations. And colleges want to see that you've done a couple of things and been committed to them. They actually don't want to see a resume that has 17 different activities where you're jumping from thing to thing, year to year. They want to see that you've picked a few things and then stuck with a few things and maybe become a leader, uh, become on the executive board of, um, of the key club. So you've been in it for two years and your senior year you're the secretary. Or you've been involved in uh, doing a tutoring project and by your junior year you're leading that project. Um, that's what they want to see. Uh, as we spoke about, your counselor is going to write you a letter of recommendation. So your brag sheet and your resume is really important. And the fact that the parents get to help fill that information out is really helpful for counselors. And um, I highly recommend that students um, are really strategic and want to start thinking now about the teachers that can write you a good recommendation. Right? And you want to help them out as best you can in writing that recommendation. So if you ask a science teacher to write your recommendation, you might even write them a paragraph in addition to your brag sheet uh, that shares a memory of something that you did in their class, maybe something that you did really well, or maybe something that was really hard for you but you worked through um, and you were successful at. And you'll use Naviance, the family connection in Naviance, to request those letters of recommendation, and your counselor will help you through that. Um, some schools still offer on-campus interviews, um, and actually they're really important. There are a lot of schools, particularly the smaller broad schools, that will um, give a little bit of extra consideration to a student who visited and did a campus interview. And if you visit a second time, if you're able to, and you document that, that actually helps you a bit more, especially if you're on their bubble. If you did their scattergram and the, the green dots are just above, just above where your data is, Extra visits to the school, showing your interest, help. They help. Um, of course, they're going to want to know if you have special talents or, or interests, if you're, um, if you're performing on the stage for a musical, or if you're backstage helping to present the musical or the play, um, if you're writing poetry, if you're a leader in uh, student government, if you're playing sports. Do you have any athletes? A couple athletes. Excellent. Um, I swam all four years through college. Um, I don't know if it helped me get in or not, but I did it. Um, and I'm glad I did it. And uh, those things will, will help you. And if you have particular interests and you can tie them to the particular school, um, that makes a lot of sense. So, you know, if you're interested in urban renewal, but you're applying to Bucknell, that's not really gonna help because Bucknell is in the middle of the woods, the middle of the country. Um, if you're interested in rural land management and you're applying to George Washington University, same thing. George Washington's in the city, not a lot of rural land management going on there. So you wanna make sure that your special interests tie into what the school offers. Um, finally, of course, any personal recognition that you've gotten. If you've won, if you've been on anything from honor roll, um, anything that you've done in high school. If you were a middle school valedictorian, that's wonderful. I don't know that you need to include that in your college application. If in sixth grade you want a dance competition, that's great. It's not gonna matter when you're applying to college. So think about the things that you've done in high school and any awards and recognition that you've gained. Um, and all of that will be a part of what a college looks for. Any questions about that part, what colleges look for? Yes? Actually, the question about the, um, the recommendations. Mm -hmm. Are they done electronically now? Yeah. Um, all, of the, all of the teacher recommendations are done. Naviance is an incredible system. Most colleges are able to um, retrieve an electronic letter of recommendation 
through the Navion system. So the student will um, go into the Family Connection and, and there's, there'll be a list of teachers and they'll send the request to the teacher on Naviance to write them a recommendation and they'll check off the schools that they're applying to. Um, of course, before they do that, they'll ask the teacher because the last thing the teacher wants is to open up their Naviance and find a request from a student that they had you know, two years ago and that student hasn't done anything to talk with that teacher to ask them to write a recommendation. So students, you want to make sure you do that. You communicate with the teacher first um, and then they'll do it electronically. Yeah, so when I did it, you know, I gave them envelopes that were, yeah, we don't have to do that anymore. It's great. That's why the postal service is having, but anyway. <laughs> Other questions, yes? Do you think it's like a, a job shop? Like if you're a counselor to some Absolutely, absolutely. There'll be space on the Common App or any regular application to put um, any job, any work experience that you have. Um, and, and then leadership positions within those jobs. So if you were a camp counselor for two summers, and then you were the lead counselor the third summer, you want to put that, absolutely. Uh, there's also an opportunity in Naviance to um, invite one community member, some outside person, to write a recommendation as well. Some schools, like uh, Rutgers, probably won't read it because they've got so many applications, they're just going to really look at your data. They're not going to read everything. But a smaller Rhodes College, if you're trying to get into Amherst and you're really close, um, a letter from the camp director about your three years of service at the camp might go a long way to help push you over the edge. Yeah. Other questions? Great. Uh, next one. So just very quickly, I want to just talk about the four kinds of college deadlines. Um, the one that we're most familiar with is a regular decision deadline, which means you're applying, we can think about with the general population, most regular decision deadlines are around December 31st or January 1st. Some schools might be February 1st. Some might even be later, like a February 15th, but that's a regular decision, which means that you're gonna just apply. Um, if you are admitted, you're gonna consider that offer, but you're not bound to anything. Okay, that's a regular decision. There are a lot of schools that will just review applications as they come in. Typically with regular decision, no matter when that deadline is, you'll find out late March whether or not you got in. So between like March 25th and April 1st is when most schools release their admissions news. If it's rolling admission, so a place like Ryder, um, Stockton does this, Rutgers does this. Rutgers has an early priority deadline, and if you, you know, submit your stuff to Rutgers by October 1st or November 1st, you'll know within about eight weeks whether or not you were accepted. So that's called rolling admissions. Um, so every eight weeks or 10 weeks, they just release decisions. The other two are um, early processes that you really want to be sure that you know about. The first is early decision. And there are tremendous benefits of applying early decision to particularly the best schools in the country if you know that that is absolutely your number one school and that regardless of aid, that that's where you want to go and that's where you want to be. The reason it's good to apply early, if you meet the selection criteria, like if you're within the ballpark for the University of Pennsylvania, there are fewer students that apply early decision and there is a higher percentage that get in, right? So it's a smaller applicant pool with a higher likelihood of success. But early decision is a binding contract. If you get in, that's the only school that you can go to. You have to withdraw all of your other applications um, and you will actually not be allowed to enroll at another institution unless there was some major, major uh, uh, family calamity, something with financial aid that doesn't work out. So you really have to be sure with early decision that that is where you want to go. It is a binding contract. You sign um, a statement when you apply early decision um, that, that binds you to that school. Um, so if, if there's a place, yes. And that is without knowledge of any financial aid from the school? That's correct. So one of the things to pay attention to, there are about 50 colleges in the country that will meet 100% of student need and are need blind in the admissions process. So those are the schools that, if, you know, if, you're, if, if aid is really important, they're also the best schools in the country. So the, the ones we named before, Caltech, MIT, Harvard, Yale, um, Penn, Swarthmore, those schools 
if you get in, will meet your full need um, as determined by the various financial aid forms that you complete. Uh, other schools, like the University of Scranton, uh, if that's your dream school, I don't know that there's a whole lot of value in applying early decision. Um, you're probably likely to get in regular decision anyway. So it's just a, it's a little bit of a calculus that you have to do to figure that out. Early action is just an early um, deadline, an early notification, but it's no commitment. And the thing about early action, like Rutgers is basically an early action program. They have an early priority deadline and they let you know early. At Princeton, uh, we don't have early decision, so we don't have that binding contract, but we do have what's called a single application early action, which means you can only apply to one place early action and you have to sign and verify that you've done that, um, and then they'll let you know uh, in December. It's a November 1st deadline and they let you know mid-December whether or not you got it. Uh, and Harvard and Stanford have the same, like, single school early action. So, someone get those four distinctions? Yes? Will they offer you a financial aid package if you apply early decision? Typically they will. So what, the, what they're going to do is they, um, they might ask for some tax information from the previous year. So when you guys apply to college, if you're a, a class of 2015, you're going to offer your 2014 tax information when you complete what's called the FAFSA. And then for some of these schools, they also require what's called the CSS profile. If you apply early decision, they might ask you to do the profile early with your 2013 information. And they would do an estimated financial aid package based on that information. And then you would update it, and then they would update the package. Is that? Yeah. All right. Any other questions on this stuff? So again, early decision, um, just wanted to reinforce it, it's binding. Um, you have to withdraw your other applications um, if you're admi admitted and you just have to make sure that you're 100% sure uh, that that's where you wanna go to school. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the different uh, college board tests. Uh, so we'll start with the SAT. Do we have any freshmen in the room? No, good, because that's when the SAT changes for our current freshman class, class of 2017. Juniors and sophomores, you get the last of the current format of the SAT, which is this, critical reading, math, and a required writing. When it changes, writing will become optional. Okay. Um, the college has a choice on whether or not to use that writing section. So the score is either out of 1,600 or out of 2,400. And I, I, for anyone who reads my guidance newsletter that, that's coming out um, the end of April, I just wrote an article detailing uh, the changes in the SAT. Any questions about? This first slide. So there's how you register. Hopefully all the juniors in here have either taken the SAT or have registered to take the SAT or the ACT, which I'm gonna talk about as well. You need to know our CEEB code. You're gonna have that memorized soon. Security is big for the SAT and the ACT. If you're following the news, um, there was a lot of um, imposters taking SAT tests, not here at Lawrence, uh, elsewhere. So security has been amped up. Okay, official reports. A college wants the SAT score from the SAT people, the college board. They do not want it from the high school. They want it to go directly from the, college, uh, from the college board. So when you sign up, when you register for the SAT, they give you four free score reports. That means four schools that you could send it to for free. We 
want students to be aware of this so you can take advantage of it because they're about $10 each. So it'll help you save a little bit of money with this. And then after you take the test, you could have scores sent out for a fee. It's going to cost you. And the College Board is a nonprofit. <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> right, down the, right down the road in Lawrence. More on the score report. Um, they go straight from College Board. It takes about three or four weeks. For a fee, you can have them sent quicker. Um, I forget what you call the, qu the, the how it's sent quicker, but I think that takes about a week to get to the college. That comes in handy sometimes. Um, all tests become part of your official record. Colleges will mix and match. So if I've taken the SAT three times and I did well on critical reading the second time, the third time was my best math score. The college will look at the entire record and they'll take the highest from each section and use that when they, when they do their evaluation. Question in the back? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm seeing a, a shadow I think back there, yes? Just on that note, if they register for three tests, do they get 12 points for that or is it one, four per, person, or is it four per each test they take? It's four per, per, per college. Uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's the entire, it's the testing record up to that date that goes out. So they don't get four, 12 free, free tests or sent out? So they, you know, I think it's each test. time you register, okay. you get the four cent. Okay. Yes? I, I think what you say, if you take it the second time and send it to Rutgers, if you take it a third time, does that automatically go to Rutgers also, or do you have to put Rutgers in again on your third time? I believe you have to keep putting Rutgers in. You would have to keep putting Rutgers in, yeah. Okay, but if you put Rutgers in a third time and you didn't put it before, they would get Rutgers all of them. They would get all of them, yes. They yeah, it's cumulative. Yeah. They do have a, a new system that's called score, score choice. That if after you take your test and you want to, if, if you didn't put in a school to, to receive uh, your scores right away, um, and you want to figure out where you're sending or you add some schools later on, you can actually pick which scores you send to a particular school. Um, so you have a little bit more control now. And uh, the whole thing with three or four weeks is actually um, literally pushing a button for them now. It used to be mailing and expedited mailing. But it's all electronic now. Um, so those are really just guidelines that the College Board has that hopefully someday, um, you know, the president of the College Board is all about access and opportunity. And they make a lot of money with this stuff. And I'm hoping that this will be one of the things that they change, uh, particularly the expedited. It makes no sense. It's literally, the colleges go in once a week and up, do a big upload of scores that have been sent to them. And it's literally a button. So, um, it's because it's all it's all electronic now. Um, so, I would never do expedited. Is my advice on that? I would, I would never do ex expedited. Yes. So, if you want college to combine your test scores, you have to make sure basically that college has your monthly set of scores. Right, but remember, when you've taken it three times and you send out the score report after the third time, it's going to send all your scores. And from that list of all, of all your test scores, they're going to mix, mix and match your highest scores. Question? If you're taking three times, wouldn't it be better, or I'm asking the gentleman who works mm -hmm. at college, to take a, to then choose which two score dates you want to get your highest score? Because yeah, I mean, it's very nice to see like a 10, 20, and you say a 12, 60. Yeah. So um, your first test that you take as a junior, I wouldn't send anywhere, except for to Lawrence High School. Um, you, if you do kind of, unless you unless you've been taking practice tests and you know that you're going to be scoring, you know, 600 plus in each section, then you know go for it. You can send them to Rutgers and then the Rutgers is done because if you're getting over 600 on your SATs now, you're likely to get into Rutgers. 
Um, if you think that you're going to you know, build and keep prepping, you might wait until your second test to really put in your, your top schools. Um, and however strategic you want to be after. But yeah, there is a little bit of figuring out you know, with what you're going to do when you're going to spend. So if you had a 10, like if something in the thousands, they had something close to a high 12s, but a college sees that you were all over the board with 300 points, is that better? Or it doesn't matter. What they'll do is they'll literally look at your top scores and they'll disregard the rest. Yeah. What would be the latest thing for to take the SAT and for it to go into the college's application? As a senior, the December SAT is typically the last time. There is a January SAT, um, and sometimes those results will get in. But it's, like, late, it's usually late January. January. Yeah, usually usually December is the one, uh, the last one. I don't know if you're going to go with this later, but then the recommendations regarding SAT health assistance. We can talk about that afterwards. Okay. There, there is some stuff in Navianz, and there's a lot of stuff online. Um, prior to the first test, or I would do prior. To, I would take at least a practice test before the first one, just so you get a sense of what it feels like. And then maybe possibly another one. Yeah. For your second one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So most kids take the junior and senior year now, I and mean, is that the? Yeah, most most folks will take uh, an SAT, you know, either the May or the June. Some some people would, would have already taken the, the January or the February. Uh, January, February. January to March. January to March. So you would you would do would you would do that in junior year, uh, kind of get a sense of what the test is like, and then really spend your summer prepping for the test, and then take it in October of your senior year. Um, you could wait till November of your senior year, or you could take it back to that, but that's what folks are doing. Yes. Now, if they do October of senior year, is that going to be um, on time for the early decision and early action? Yes. I wouldn't do it. If you've already taken it twice or three times, you're not going to get a better score. It's not worth it. And I would—I I, I know your advice. My advice is no more than three tests. It's just not—it's not worth it. They're not going to see a change. Okay. Uh, there's plenty of practice uh, information uh, online. Um, we offer the old-fashioned uh, booklet in the counseling office, but you're, you're going to find everything that you need online. Okay. With subject tests, the second bullet is probably the most important. It's not required by all schools. It's required only by some. The more competitive schools that we've been talking about tonight are usually the ones that ask for uh, subject tests. You cannot take them the same day as the SAT, so you have to schedule it at different times. So typically, you're gonna take your SAT one, two, or even three times, and then when that process is done and you have a better sense of where you'll be attending school, then you'll go and see what that college requires as far as subject test goes and you'll go ahead and take them. So the rule of thumb is if it's a school that, you, that you're gonna go to and they don't require them, you don't have to worry about it. If they do require them, then you have to follow the instructions and go ahead and, and take them and get them done. Okay, we're gonna talk about, Jason's gonna talk about the differences between the two tests Security is big for the ACT. The scoring range is different for the ACT. The sectioning is different. There's a scientific reasoning section. There's a math and English and a reading section. Writing is an optional section, but it's strongly recommended to do the writing part of the ACT. If you're gonna go ahead and take the ACT, do the writing, because that way a college can compare it 
to the SAT, if, that, if that's what you've taken. And then some schools have the flexibility of using an ACT score in place of the SAT subject. Okay, we offer a lot of the tests here at Lawrence, we're lucky. Um, the June SAT is here, the June ACT is here as well, yes. Like, for which majors should you take the, SAT, the ACT, like, like, what is the best? Like, what kind of major would be best for you? It's, it's really the same, SAT or ACT. It's not really uh, relevant to a major. The, the only time, uh, if, you're, if you're thinking about particular majors, uh, engineering and sciences, um, if you're going to uh, major in chemistry, then uh, the school might want to see a chemistry subject test regardless of what their policy is about ACT and SAT. Engineering, they're, they're going to want to see physics, math, and a science as well. The, the better engineering schools will want that. But that's really the only space uh, where it matters. Otherwise, ACT, SAT, it's a personal problem. So you see the ACT has a September date, and you remember the SAT has an October date. What's a popular thing to do because kids are so busy with activities and sports and jobs and everything else, is to, if you're gonna prep, if you're gonna prep for ACT or SAT, to do so over the summer when the child has some time and then come into the year ready to go in September for the ACT or October for the SAT. So that, that's been a popular trend the last few years based on how busy kids are today. Okay, Jason. So I want to go through this a little bit quickly, just getting a check of time. Um, the ACT and the SAT are two very different kinds of tests. Um, and the, the SAT is a little bit more um, about uh, your uh, aptitude and ability to actually just take a test. And the ACT looks a little bit more about what you've studied and learned in, um, in high school. Uh, you guys are still going to be in a space where you've got the, the current SAT, where the median score is 1,500. That's 500 on each section, with a maximum score of 800 in each section. Um, and there is a penalty in the SAT for guessing. So something to think about strategy-wise. Uh, the ACT has no penalty for guessing, but the timing is a little different for each test. So it's one of those things that you might want to practice, grab the test booklet, grab the, the practice booklet, see which one fits you better. Um, if you find that you score, you know, uh, if you score a, in all three sections, your SAT score is a 1340, but your ACT score is a 24, that 24 is a better score, and you might want to prep and work toward that, that ACT. If you get a 1780 on the SAT, and a 21 on the, uh, sorry, on the SAT, 16, 1780, and then on, you take the ACT and you get a 19, probably not worth it to take another ACT. Um, but we work with students to think about both tests uh, and to do some preparation for both tests and then see which one you're a little bit stronger at and you feel more comfortable with. Okay, yes. For the SAT, if there's a guessing penalty, if you left it blank, is that not? I don't think so. So if you don't complete the section and you leave a question blank, um, I don't think there's a penalty for leaving a blank. But I'm, I'm not sure. That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. If you leave a blank, you don't get any points, but you don't lose, you don't any, lose points. any points. Right. On the SAT. Yeah. Um, you got a question. Question back. Sorry. Yes. Can you use 1500? Is that out of 1800 or out of 2400? Out of 2400. So the SAT has the three sections critical reading, math, and writing. And each section, the maximum score is 800. The median for each is 500. Um, in the ACT, the sections, all of them are scored 1 to 36. So you would get a score, the median is about 21, 22 across the board. And then they do a composite score. So you might be you know, 22 in science and 28 in math and 26 in, in English, and it would come out to a composite score of maybe a 24, uh, which isn't that. Um, 
a lot of folks get a, get a little scared with the science section in the ACT. A lot of it is just understanding data and not about particular science. The big trick on the ACT is that you read something about oceanography and you think, I know nothing about oceanography. But all the information that is on the, all, all the information that they're asking for is in the data. It's all there. So it's, it's, they, it's a little bit of getting you tripped up on what the science is, but that's not what they're looking for. It's can you interpret the data and answer the question? Yes? So if you particularly excel at math, mm -hmm. and you expect your grade to be higher in that, is it better to, do they, do they see all three of the colleges, see all each section? So the ACT one? score report, they would see all of the sections. So they would see the variability that you got a 34 in math and a 28 in English, and then the, the composite. So it's about the same. Yeah. yeah. And all the schools do either. It, most schools take either. So either the, the ACT or the SAT. Some of the selective schools will ask for the SAT plus subject tests, usually two, or the ACT. And then some schools, depending on how um, strict they are, Georgetown is, I think, the last holdout. They require three subject tests no matter what you do. So you just have to really pay attention to what each school is looking for. And again, you create a college list on Naviance and it's going to tell you exactly what those, um, what those things are. Yes? Okay. So what's the trend now? Are they taking like five tests in one year? That's, or like a, a fall and then an SAT, then an act? And, and so the way, the way we do it with PUP is that um, all of our juniors prep for the December SAT their junior year. The December. So December SAT, their junior year, is the first one they take. Then they take the, uh, they prep for the April ACT. Okay. And then again, depending on one, which one they did better on or enjoyed more, they take it again in June, either the SAT or the ACT. So they've done two tests, they've done three tests junior year. Two of one particular test. Exactly, and one of the other. And then, and then depending on where the scores are, we look again at senior year at the October testing. Actually, depending on the booklet, and there's also all sorts of stuff to purchase, so Barron's and Peterson's and Pearson and Princeton Review and Kaplan, they all have books that you can use, and there are courses locally um, that would do practice tests that would score them for you, or if you're using one of the books, a lot of the books now come with a DVD uh, that you can, a uh, program you can install on your computer, you can take the test on your computer and it will score it for you. Okay, so somebody called in there. One of the, the DVD or something like that, and I didn't commit to it because um, I didn't know what it was. So. Yeah, I would, I would, if someone calls and so I, I would, you know, you can go on Amazon and oh. look at the products that are out there. And I mean, I don't have a recommendation on which one's better. They're all about the same, quite frankly. Um, Typically, you would pay for the, the say, the mini 12 week, whatever course, the $2.99 or you know, whatever it was for one particular test, and then you pay again $2.99 for the act? So, like, they don't combine, typically? So if you're, if you're gonna pay for a course from an outside provider, right. um, it would either be an SAT course or an ACT course. Right. They wouldn't do both in the same. Okay. So it would be two fees. So before the SAT, if, if I choose to, it's yeah. $2.99, $3.99, whatever course for SAT, and then prior to, say, fall, as an example, and then prior to the act, Two ninety nine, three ninety nine, whatever for the app. And you then, could do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Can subject tests be more than Yes, they can. Yeah. That's not really. I don't know if it's advisable. You should, what, one of the things that was up there was that if you're taking an AP course, um, you should try to overlap your AP course with a subject test, um, and that's a good way to get a couple of the uh, subject tests. The tests are different. The SAT subject tests are a little bit easier than the than the AP tests. Okay. Generally, they're easier. Yeah. All right. Let me move to the next one. So, completely different topic. So, shifting gears from testing, which I know is a little big stress thing. Um, college visits are just important. That's all I want to say. 
Um, try to go when schools are in session, take every opportunity that you have a day off. Um, here, you can do a longer college tour if you'd like. Um, if, if you are really interested in the school, sometimes they have um, overnight housing opportunities. They'll house you with the student um, if you want to do a visit like that. Uh, depending on when you go, you might be able to visit an actual classroom and see a class in session. Um, you know, definitely do a campus tour, talk with admissions folks. Um, all of that is fun. You'll learn, um, ask them how hard it is to walk and talk back, walk backwards and talk and all that. Um, but the, it's, it's good to see a school. It's good to see where you're applying. That's a really important part of what we do. So definitely, definitely take advantage of, of uh, college visits. And also here at Lawrence, there'll be a number of colleges that come to visit um, and college reps will come and you can check that schedule on Naviance. They come during the school day, so you get out of class, which you shouldn't be too excited about, but you could be a little bit excited about. Uh, on financial aid, and I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about this, um, cost of college is very important. Every college now is required to have a net price calculator. And what that does is it takes your information, and you can take it from the previous year's taxes, put it into a computer program with the cost of attendance. They'll ask you for income, they'll ask you a little bit about your family assets, and any savings you might have, and then they'll calculate the price. And that's really important, because you might see a school, particularly a private school, that costs, you know, the, the, the tuition and fees, the bottom line might be $55,000 a year, um, if you're getting no aid whatsoever, but it actually might cost you only 5,000 to go there. It really depends on the school. Um, if you're a, a, a family that needs full financial need based on your income, um, there are schools that will meet your full need. So it'll be cheaper for you to go to a more expensive school than it would for you to go uh, to a cheaper school. Does that make sense? So you can uh, use that net price calculator to figure those things out. Yes? Sorry, did you say that was on every website? Yes, every college has to have it. It's typically found on the financial aid website um, for the Office of Financial Aid. And, it, and there'll, it'll literally be a link that says net price calculator. Some of the colleges are actually putting it on their homepage or on the admissions homepage, and that's all required by, uh, by the federal government that they have that available. So that's the net price calculator. Uh, very quickly, the NCAA Clearinghouse for the athletes that are here. I'm not gonna say too much, except uh, if the student is a Division I or a Division II athlete, Rutgers is Division I, then, and the student's being recruited and offered a scholarship, the student needs to go through the NCAA Clearinghouse in order to get eligible and to be able to play in college and to uh, accept that scholarship. So there's a whole criteria, there's a sliding scale for Division I and Division II athletes um, in order to be eligible, their GPA and their SAT. Um, that does not apply to Division III schools. So Rutgers, Ryder are Division I schools. TCNJ is a Division III school. Um, there's no scholarship at Division III schools. Okay, so Clearinghouse does not apply. However, those Division III schools, um, mo uh, most of the time are NCAA institutions. And while you're not gonna get a scholarship for playing a sport, you might get help in admission for playing a sport. Okay, so that's where the benefit comes in at a Division III. This is the new required slide for kids. Admissions officers have been known to look at the social networks of the, of the applicants in their recruiting efforts. So we try to encourage our kids, <clears throat> just like they do around the high school, the social life of the high school, to be careful what they post. We want them to keep in mind that they may, that, that may impact their college uh, future. Jason. Yep. So one thing before we wrap up that I actually want to show 
um, you, so these are just kind of uh, highlights from, from the conversation today, but I want to actually take everyone um, to this website, which is collegeresults.org. Um, there are lots of college search websites. You're going to do a lot of stuff in Naviance using Family Connection. The College Board also has a great search function. But uh, my favorite search function in terms of data is collegeresults.org. And what it does is it gives you just a tremendous wealth of information. So our engineer, Dream College. Dream College. Did we say Rutgers? Yeah. New Brunswick? Yes. All right. So. We'll start there. So we'll start looking at Rutgers University Newark. And what this website does, it's got a tremendous database of information here. So the first thing you see, um, it's public. It's got 30,000 undergraduates. It's in a small city. I'll give you a little map there. Um, on the right-hand side, there's going to be some student success highlights. So they've got a 91% retention rate, first-year student coming back to second-year student. Not bad. Um, we scroll down a little bit more. Picture's not so rosy for the four-year graduation rate. Rutgers University, only five out of ten finish in four years. So be thinking about your five-year plan. Um, five-year, six-year plan is about the same, 70%, which is really solid. Um, nationally, only 55% of, of young people that start college finish in four to six years, period. So they're doing pretty well at 70%. Um, as you scroll down, you get to see the median SAT scores, GPA, um, debt and cost, percent admitted. So 60% of students that apply to Rutgers get in. They're not particularly selective. Um, and then there's some student characteristics. So get a sense of the diversity on campus. So that's just on the home page for each school. One thing you can do if you want to see, well, what are some similar colleges to Rutgers? You click this little button here for similar colleges, and it takes you to a great grid. Um, in this case, the grid is based on the left-hand column, which is the six-year graduation rate. And, and they've got Rutgers kind of in the middle. And you've got the, the schools that are just above and just below in terms of the six-year graduation rate. And then all sorts of data across the way in terms of uh, median SAT score, average GPA, percent underrepresented minority. It's just a tremendous amount of, um, of information. Let's hear another college, someone's, someone's absolute reach school. Yeah. Johns Hopkins, all right. I couldn't get in there now. All right, so we're going to choose another college. And we're going to go Johns Hopkins University. So Johns Hopkins is in a large city, Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, 58,000 undergraduates, which is about 2,000 more than when I was there. 96% um, retention rate. Great 84% four-year graduation rate, up to a 90% six-year graduation rate. So there's a lot of student success there. But to get in, the median SAT score is very high, over 700 in math. Um, costs are a little bit more. It's a private school. Hopkins does meet full need. Um, sometimes that, that package will include loans, but they are committed to meeting full student need. Um, and you can get a sense of their diversity. 13% uh, underrepresented minority. 12% of students earning, getting a Pell Grant. That means those are the lowest income students uh, in the country. So that gives you a sense of Hopkins. Another great thing that you can look at here is um, they disaggregate some of the graduation rate data. So if you want to know how um, African American students are doing or how Asian American students are doing, um, you can kind of get a sense of the different racial and ethnic groups and their graduation rates over six years. And then they'll do a comparison um, where well, they will compare their graduation rates with some of their peers. And in this case, they've got Johns Hopkins lined up with, um, oops, sorry about that, uh, with Stanford, Yale, Harvard, uh, the, and then other top five um, private not-for-profits. So you can get a sense of where it ranks. Um, let me go back. So we'll do one more school. Um, and this is where I think it's important. I, I'm just going to add one in here. There's a school that, that um, I, I apologize if I offend everyone. We'll, we'll, we'll just do, uh, we'll do Jersey City. 
which is one of the state publics that we say um, that we shouldn't be looking at, and, and you'll see why. Yeah. Like graduation rate, 6.5%. Less than one out of 10 finished at Jersey City in four years. So as you're getting information about colleges and thinking about them, collegeresults.org is a great place for you to go to just get a sense of what's the success rate? What are the median SAT scores? What's the value? How does it compare to other similar colleges? So I just want to put a plug. The, the Education Trust, which is a nonprofit in Washington, D.C., puts this together. And the most uh, recent data they have is for the class of 2011. And back to our last slide of the night. And go for slide two. Ooh. And it was good luck. That was the last slide. So um, here's another listing just to some, some websites as well. Uh, and this, is a, this, what, this presentation will be available for you. Um, FastWeb is a great scholarship website. Um, FinAid.org explains the financial aid process. Uh, CollegeResults.org we just looked at. The NCAA for athletes. Uh, the College Board for college searches and for the SAT. Then you have ACT for the ACT. Uh, and then finally FAFSA, which is for your financial aid that you'll um, really get into next year. All right. Any last questions? Yes. We're still linked to the slideshow, or? We're supposed to post a question. Is there a link to the slideshow, or? Uh, yeah. To, to see the entire presentation, if you go to the guidance, web, uh, guidance website, the high, uh, go to the district, then go to the high school, and then go to the guidance calendar of events. It's going to take us about a week or two to put it up, but eventually it'll be there, and you'll be able to see all the other presentations that we had this year, and guidance calendar of events, if you, had, if you didn't attend. Yes? What is the value of the PSAD for students that are younger than uh, juniors? The PSAD is the uh, has, uh, there, there are two, two or three big things that are important for the PSAT. Um, for sophomores and juniors, it really, it's, it's an opportunity to practice that style of test. And it's really modeled after the SAT. So it gives you a sense of what the test is like and what your score range is going to be. Um, the PSAT produces a really nice um, overview of your results and your strengths and areas for development, um, which is really a useful tool. And your student's guidance counselor would have that and you could get a copy of it. For juniors that are top students, the PSAT is also um, a qualifying exam for the National Merit Scholarship. So if you're a top student scoring in the 95th percentile or higher, you might get invited to the National Merit Competition as well. So that's, those are the two couple of pieces. The PSAT also is a marketing tool um, that ends up give, getting you on the radar screen of colleges across the country, and it triggers kind of a, a mail flood of, um, of mail from colleges. So it can figure out what you want to do with that. I, think, I don't think that's going anywhere anytime soon. That kind of marketing is still going to be around. Any other last questions? Yes. Have you been to make a PSAT in your sophomore year you take it in the beginning of junior year? Yeah, you were taken in October, October of your junior year. We've had it, um, all of our juniors will take it on the, I believe it's the third Wednesday in October during the school day. Okay. And we invite our sophomores to take it as well. The juniors take it for free. That's the PSAT? That's the PSAT, yes. During the school day? Yeah, during school day, yeah. Yeah, so if your child was a sophomore this year, they had that choice. But all our juniors took it this year on school day. It's a roughly a three hour test. They're done by 10, 10, 30. Maybe a little later. Anything else? I want to thank Jason for coming out and helping me with this presentation. I also want to thank again our students in the back. I believe it's Ryan and Nadia. So thank you. And have, have a great night. Thank you. <laughs>